What is going on, guys? Welcome back. Commentary for you. Jimmy Smith, Ryan Moody, RMA Show. Every once in a while, we miss one. We missed one, but we're back. Better than ever. Yeah, but that wasn't our fault. A little caveat is the card we broke down, the whatever it was, two days before, was not the card you saw on Saturday. All the weight misses and everything. It was just totally different. It was just totally shot by the time it actually got on air. So a little caveat there. Can but we... Can we just talk just briefly about sure. Jessica I having that infamous weight speech and then just yes. going on a missing rampage afterwards? Why 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 would you even set yourself up for that? I, I don't know, man. That's crazy. I, and like I said, I've 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 spent time around Jessica and Bellator and, and whatever, and I was in Vegas doing a, a thing for Sirius XM and, and she was at the gym and we hung out and you know, I really like her a lot, but yeah, that was, that was crazy. That was that was insane. She just Man, she really became uh, a target of fan animosity over the last couple of weeks. It's crazy. As her friend, Jimmy, I'm at a level with you. Can you try to explain to me why she had her arm raised after that fight? I have. I, I don't know, man. I have no idea. That's kind of the weird thing. I've seen fighters do that. It's just like after a long fight, you're just kind of celebrating. You know, like I got through a tough fight or you're trying to sell that you won and I don't know. I have no idea. But people do it for all different kinds of reasons. Was it Charles Jourdain that was taken back that a judge got it in his face? Someone was taken back, like, that they got the decision in their name. I think it was him. But, yeah, I was, when she had her arm raised and showed, like, dismay, I was like, uh, I don't know if what? you, I, I know you were in the fight, but did you, did you watch? Did, I, could you not? I mean, it was pretty one-sided. Yeah, but you're you're told as a fighter at the end, always raise your hands like you want. Always show the the judges, and of course there's no crowd, but show the judges and everybody in attendance that you won the fight, no matter what happened or how you feel about it. So it's like kind of a blanket rule to do that. Let's talk about the other piece of news that came out. Why well, you don't say it came out today? It was shown today. Mike Perry shows an Instagram post of him. Now, I know some people have brought up, you know, uh Cowboy Cerrone had did this when he was filming a movie. I don't believe this was. I, first of all, I like Mike Perry a lot. I've met Mike a couple of occasions. I don't believe he is the person to A, be acting in a movie at a time like this, and B, promote injuries that are real as fake for the sake of, I mean, let's say selling a fight with Mickey Gall that, to be honest with you, I think... Mike's value has dropped a lot based on his performances. So to me, I, I don't know that I'm looking forward to a Mike Perry fight the way I used to look forward to a Mike Perry fight. So I, I, it was just very cryptic. It, it looks like he got into a a fight with someone in the street, which I, I can't believe somebody would fight him on the street. I mean, if they did, he took a lot of damage for fighting on the street to his head. Uh, but you know that's Mike Perry, right? Like he, we need we need more Mike Perrys in, in MMA. I believe it was weird because apparently somebody showed a thing like a little while later and he looked all healed up, which medically doesn't happen in a couple days. I mean, the, the the cuts he had, especially on his forehead, looked like if he didn't get taken care of, it, it's gonna be tough to not have that bust open in the fight. And then somebody showed, oh, wait, no, like the next day he put, put something on Instagram or wherever it was, and he looked fine. So it was, just, it, was, it was goofy. It was really goofy for all the reasons you're saying, because there's no real explanation of what's going on. You don't get injuries like that. Sparring doesn't work that way, guys. You know, you have gloves on, you have headgear. Um, you might get one cut. You wouldn't get that. That looks like street fight shit. Like you threw a punch at somebody, hit the side of a wall. It was just the weirdest shit ever. But with Mike Perry, you never know. The dude's just such an X factor and a weird, you know, like his girlfriend's going to be in his corner and all this goofy stuff. You just never know how, you know, straight that guy has his head on. So it's it's just weird coming from him. I need Mike Perry and Charles Bennett to somehow combine forces into, into a <laughs> like if It wouldn't be Sean O'Malley. It, it would be a totally different beast. I, that's who I need. I need Mike Bennett as a fighter, you know, really, to be fair. He was so one of the weirdest the guys, Crazy Horse. I mean, because I saw him a lot coming out because we came up at about the same time in the early 2000s in Southern California. So I, I fought on cards and I was at a lot of cards where Crazy Horse was there. And it was like, he's just the weirdest dude. And the problem is, is you saw flashes of real talent. 
you saw flashes of real like, man, this if this guy trained at all, he would be pretty good. You know, he just never had that in him. And so, you know, um, it, it was it was frustrating and disappointing and weird to like even watch him fight was strange. And then I've, I was at fights where he would just like give up at the end of fights or midway through a fight and just stop and like start goofing around and, and lose decisions. It was just a weird guy to watch. Undefeated against Wanderlei Silva, though, right? Oh, yeah. Everybody knows that famous fight in, uh, in Pride. There, he ended up getting choked out in a locker room. Look it up on YouTube, guys. All right. For all the uh, keyboard complainers, six minutes. We'll get into the card. Don't fret. It is from the UFC Apex yet again, Blades versus Volkov. We're going to start the card. Catchweight, Jim Miller, Roosevelt Roberts. Roberts off a quick win. Uh, I like Roosevelt Roberts a lot. We we joked that he would be a, a former president. But, you know, the guy really has built upon his skill set, works well behind his jab, uses his frame really well. Uh, obviously, with Jim Miller, we know what Jim wants to do. Get this to the ground, get a guillotine. I know that Jim Miller's kind of had a career resurgence, and I love that. I'm a big Jim Miller fan, but at the same time, I really feel like Roosevelt Roberts is just going to outbox him a little bit here, and I'm going to take Roosevelt Roberts with the win. In a fight like this, and this is an archetype we've seen a lot, um, Sean O'Malley, Eddie Wineland, what, the, the, the up-and-comer making the name in the UFC versus the veteran who has a legacy, who's on the back nine of their career. This is just a common thing in, in combat sports, right? This is different than Sean O'Malley versus Wineland because I think it's closer, right? Robert Rizzo, Robert's an, an excellent fighter, very talented, doesn't have the one-shot power and kind of the dazzling physical skills of a Sean O'Malley. And Jim Miller hasn't had that off a cliff kind of performance where he's not what he used to be. We also, you know, as you said, the late career resurgence, there's still enough blade left on the knife that he can do some damage, right? So it's it's kind of a closer, it's, it's the same kind of fight. I think it's going to be a lot closer, but Roosevelt Roberts, I think, is a little too physically talented for a faded Jim Miller. I think Jim Miller is going to have problems on the feet. And Roosevelt Roberts has an excellent submission game. You know, 10 wins, five of them by submission. He has an excellent ground game. It's not like Jim Miller is going to take him down and have his way with them. He might be the superior grappler, but not by so much. I think it overcomes the age disparity, the uh, the physical disparities. He's a tall guy, six foot one for this weight class. That's really tall. I don't think Jim Miller gets around those gifts at his age. So I think it's Roosevelt Roberts, probably by decision. Jim Miller's tough to finish. We move up to welterweight. An exciting fight, in my opinion, below Muhammad Lyman Good. You know, Muhammad has really good takedowns. He uses the cage well, but one thing that really frustrates me when I look back at his footage is he tends not to protect himself when he throws shots and when you fight a guy like Lyman Good's got plenty of power uses really nice feints mixes in some knees I think if you look at the clinch probably going to be equal I think this is going to stay on the feet and I just think although I like Willem out a lot I think he just makes mistakes and if you want to make mistakes you can do that against guys that don't have a lot of power but Lyman Good is not that guy I, I feel like someone will get knocked out in this fight, and it's probably going to be below Muhammad. See, I kind of disagree tactically about this fight, meaning he does have the deficiencies you're talking about. But one thing about his style is he angles a lot, and he has a really good takedown. And that's been Lyman Good's kryptonite, is fighting the takedown. If you stand and bang or want to stand up battle with um, Lyman Good, you're in trouble just because the guy has a lot of natural power and he can knock you out. I don't think Bilal Muhammad does that. He has this awkward, weird kind of style where he sucks you in to this, to, to, to thinking he's going to brawl. Then he drops levels and takes you down. Simple double leg, puts you against the fence. Good clinch work. I think it's a boring fight. And I think that's Bilal Muhammad's kind of fight. And I think that's the kind that, that Lyman Good has had trouble with. So to me, I think he angles, keeps his hands high, is wary of the power. And every chance he gets, he goes for a takedown. And that eventually wears Lyman Good down and he wins a decision. So I think it's going to be anything but a knockout kind of fight. You know, obviously, Lyman Good has his way, but I think Bilal Muhammad will do everything he can to keep this out of boxing range and makes this a grapple fest, and that's where he wins against a bigger, stronger, more athletic opponent. I I I understand that, and I, yeah. I agree with you. If, if they were in the larger cage, I, I actually mm. thought 
uh, with the smaller cage, which uh, let me just say, we didn't mention this, but it, it obviously factors into some fights last week too. Sure. I never want to see the bigger cage again. If, if we could use the smaller cage all the time, be fantastic. I've, I've been hearing you know, that to a be lot. Honest, <laughs> yeah, no more big cage. We're done. We're not friends anymore, big cage. I, I literally looked at these fights uh, in, in, until you said that, until you said the word angle, it never even crossed my mind that I looked at this fight in the context of the smaller cage. Well, I, I, there might not be a lot of, of center octagon takedowns. It might be a lot of clinch work, put him against the fence, wear him down, wear him down, wear him down. It might be that kind of thing because of the smaller octagon. We might see Bilal Muhammad go to that, that uh, the underhook, um, work, work against the fence, cheap, you know, snatch single legs against when he has him uh, backed up against it, things like that. So he might change his wrestling around, but I think he keeps it in that range. I think it's probably a boring fight. And the smaller octagon might benefit him because Lyman Good isn't going to have a lot of room to run. He isn't going to have a lot of room to set up a lot of his power shots. He's going to have to kind of wing them. I think that falls into uh, right into Muhammad's game plan. Moving up the card, two girls that I don't think anyone dislikes. Raquel Pennington, Marianne Renault. You know... Renault's coming off a larger layoff, back-to-back -back losses. Raquel Pennington's not in that great of a place either on a three out of four fight skid. When I look at Marianne Renault, though, she's looked good. Nice combos, really good movement. When I look at Raquel Pennington, I just constantly get reminded that she does not have the power. She literally has every other tool as a fighter, but she does not have the power. When I watched her fights, I, you use the analogy of like the energy bar. In, in fighting games, I thought to myself, if you're fighting Raquel Pennington and you have a full energy bar, she just doesn't have enough power to constantly get your bar down into the red. You know, she's got every other tool. She just doesn't have that power. And, and I know it's the last thing to go. So, you know, it's going to probably be something that she lacks for the, an extended period of time. But I just don't see her throwing enough volume in three rounds. I, I know Marianne Rowe can be a bit too patient, and I worry about that. But I really feel like this is going to be Marion Rose's fight. I, I think Pennington is probably going to be a bit volume heavy. But I literally thought that Raquel would win on points. But I literally just talking with you, going over the smaller cage, you thinking below Muhammad Lyman Good is going to be a boring fight. I'm going to inverse my pick and go with the less boring of the two fighters. Marion Renault wins. Decision. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. I'm going with Raquel Pennington based on her experience level. She's been in there against better talent. She's fought better talent. She's beaten better talent. She just didn't. I mean, I was unfortunate enough to be there in Brazil when she fought Amanda Nunes. Um, if you remember, she famously wanted to quit and her corner kind of talked her back into it. The only step down performances, the only performances she's had where she didn't lose to top talent since like 2013 um the worst opponent she's lost to holly Holm. both by decision the first one split very very close fight she hasn't had that step down performance her loss is holly Holm twice jermaine duran to me amanda nunez uh jessica andrade i mean those are all world-class fighters and remember she has a win in the rematch against jessica andrade won by by rear naked she has an opportunistic submission game She's big for the weight class. Nunez beat her up, but she didn't physically just push her around. I think that's a big uh, factor as well in the, in the smaller octagon. So I think Ra Raquel Pennington has the size. She has the experience. She has an opportunistic game. She's taking on Marin Reno, who's lost her last two. She might be a little bit down right now. Um, I would go, I would give the slight edge to Raquel Pennington. I believe it probably goes the distance. I, I am, did I just hear? You say Holly Holm, world class fighter. Look, you know how I feel about Holly Holm. All I'm saying is she's been a contender for a long time. She hasn't had a step down against a name you don't know. Holly Holm, Jermaine Duran, me, Amanda Nunez, uh, Andrade. I mean, she's fought the elite of those weight classes. Now, I, I want to say something real quick because I went over this today on my Sirius XM show, and Holly Holm is an indication of how crappy. The divisions are at 35 and 45 that she's always in it. She's always near the top. She's always, you know, just below title contention is because the divisions themselves aren't deep enough to kind of wipe away Holly Holm. It's not she's a bad fighter. It's that she's constantly in that elite class when I don't think in any other division she would be.
except 35 and 45 in women's MMA, which is pretty light. So she's a name in the division. And Raquel Pennington has has yet to lose to a name in her UFC career. Well, I do know one thing. I, I do know one thing. Jimmy, this is the show that it happened. You have officially been kicked out as the president of the Anti-Holy Home Fan Club. They're going to have to go through an election now because you, for the past... They're officers and everything, yeah. I, I am blown away. When Literally, when I was going through this card, I said to myself, Jimmy literally thinks Holly Holm, the Buster Douglas of MMA, one of the worst, I don't want to say one of the worst fighters, but but you really, it, it like, to you, there's good, bad, and then there's Holly Holm. I was like, there's no way that, that, that Jimmy would do this. But you know what? We're going to have to. I wonder if you can still get one of those Holly Holm t shirts. I bet they're probably on clearance right now. One of those nice Preacher's Daughters t shirts, I think, is what will get you. Look, all I'm saying is that to me, Holly Holm has always been the Buster Douglas of MMA. She had one great performance, and she's never looked that good since, yet she's always near the top and she's always getting title shots or always in the mix for that. And it's frustrating for me as a fan. That's all. Look. You just said world class talent. That that's that that's the snippet when, when they when they put together the best Did of you segment. Edit that clip out of there. Okay. Yeah. When, when they put together the best of segment, which we can't. Do, people have asked, why don't we do a best of segment? Listen, guys, every show is the best of segment. Every week we raise our own bar. But I would it's like to cold. compile. I would like to compile a Jimmy Smith Holly Holm segment of clips that culminates with that world class fighter. I feel like it would be. Very well received by the community. Mm. Moving forward, Josh Emmett, Shane Burgos. Burgos is kind of rebuilding his record. This guy, though, I mean, huge power, textbook right hook. He does just a great job with mixing up his shots, his combos. Emmett is a smaller fighter, but, man, he has power as well. I was there in Philly when, when he literally just deleted Michael Johnson from the planet. I think, though, he has the movement to evade and frustrate Burgos, even in the smaller cage. This one, though, or the whole card, th- this was the hardest one for me to call. I'm actually, though, going to go with Burgos because I think he's fought better talent. And I-, I think we just went through this with two fighters. I can't remember who they were. And I talked about one fighter going up higher than the other. I feel like momentum is a big thing right now. Especially, you know, camps are, are are weird. You know, you've got gyms that are shut down. I think momentum plays a bigger factor in some of this than we'll ever know. And confidence. And I feel like Shane is just going to have more confidence than Josh Emmett right now. I'm going to give him the win on this one. But I, I feel like this will be fight of the night for sure. Uh, this is the fans' main event. Really, like every fan I've talked to, it's like, oh, this is a good card. You know, I think it's going to be really entertaining. Josh Emmett, Shane Burgos. This is one everybody's looking forward to. I disagree with you in terms of the talent level. I think Josh Emmett has fought the better talent. Um, Obviously, a a contender in Ricardo Lamas. I know he didn't make weight for that one. Jeremy Stevens was on the wrong side of that one. But Mursad Bektik, I think a very, very talented fighter. Um, Michael Johnson, inconsistent. But I think Josh Emmett, has fought the 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 more name talent than Shane Burgos. The biggest name on his resume, Calvin Cater, who when he started out, remember he was winning that fight. Then Calvin Cater made some adjustments and came back. Of course, Cub Swanson, but Cub Swanson isn't the guy he used to be. That was a split decision. So I think Josh Emmett has fought the more relevant talent recently, but the guy is just built like a house for this weight class. Incredibly strong. It's like he suddenly realized, wait, I can knock people out. He was a decision guy up until the Ricardo Lamas fight. And then it's it's been nothing but finishes since then. So it's almost like, which is rare at this point in his career, that you suddenly kind of change styles and become kind of his power puncher, but he did. What makes this so interesting is not only are both guys good and powerful and knock you out, they're both vulnerable, right? Josh Emmett, we saw against Jeremy Stevens, just a vicious elbow KO from Jeremy Stevens. Shane Burgos, as I mentioned, against Calvin Cater was doing well. And then uh, Calvin Cater adjusted well and, and got the knockout. So both these guys have vulnerabilities to go along with their offense, right? They attack a lot, so you can attack them. They, they, a, a good opponent, who's a solid boxer, and both these guys are, can find those vulnerabilities. I'm just barely going with Josh Emmett. Um, I thought he looked fantastic against Mursad Bektik, who's a fighter I like a lot. Um, pretty much owned him, went after him very, very quickly. I think Josh Emmett, brimming with confidence right now, 
barely, I'm going with Josh Emmett. Main event, Jimmy just poo-pooed it a little bit. But your main event is going to be... I, I, I don't know how this couldn't be. I, I'm more excited for this than I am Shane Burgos, Josh Emmett, Curtis Blades, Alexander Volkov. To me, it, it's a tale of recent fights as well. You know, going back and looking at these last two fights these guys had. Blades, I'm sure he beat JDS, but he didn't establish the takedown. He did show good stand-up power in his straight. He got JDS up against the cage, used good clinches and knees. He, he really is a top fighter in the division. But I'll tell you, when I went back and looked at Volkov, e even re-watching the fight, obviously he gets kind of that last-minute replacement with Greg Hardy. And, and that was a tough fight. But, I mean, I went back and I listened to our podcast, too. We both really thought Greg Hardy was just going to get demolished. And it was almost like Volkov never really went 100%. And I had to ask myself, you know, was he being conservative? Or is he not maintaining himself at a high level? I mean, sure, great kickboxing, probably has a better clinch. Does leave his head a little bit high, and that does concern me in this smaller cage. I think all things considered, I'm going to look for Blades to get this in a third-round stoppage. Yeah, I th the reason I pick Blades to win this fight is just there's more ways he can win. His stand-up looked great against Junior Dos Santos. Now, Dos Santos, of course, not in his prime, once again, on the back nine of his career. but. Um, so his stand-up isn't lacking to the point where Volkov's going to go in there and just blow him away. He's a superior wrestler. He has no problem with his gas tank. Um, there are just more ways Blades can win. Volkov has to outstrike him either to a decision or knock him out. Can he do both of those things? Sure. I just don't see him really staying on the feet long enough to do that. Another thing, Blades has a really great ground and pound. You saw he did to to over him. And man, just opened up a river in between his eyes. The guy's vicious on top. And he is solidly, and rarely do we see this, solidly number four in the division. Meaning, I don't see anyone below number four beating him, and I don't see anybody above number four that he can beat. He's had two fights against Nkana, who's lost both of them. I don't see him beating DC, and I don't being, see him beating Stipe. So he's kind of locked in this number four spot. And uh, unless Volkov lands a knockout shot, which he is capable of doing, I really believe he can do it. It's just, I think... Blades uses enough of his takedown, enough of his wrestling to nullify that threat. And the last time Volkov took on a dedicated wrestler was Tony Johnson in Bellator. I called that fight and he got taken down almost at will and just really couldn't do anything against him. I know that was a while ago, but that was the last time he took, a, took, uh, took on a guy who was willing to out wrestle him and really go for it the entire time. That's what I think Blades does. Well, you know what, Jimmy? More disagreements than we normally have. A revelation about Holly Holm, a longer show than normal. I don't know what more people can ask for at this point. I mean, we just try to deliver every time. Well, this time we did deliver, I think. If not, let us know in the comments section, and we'll try to do better next time. But again, we're constantly raising our own bar, so I don't know how we can expect to do that. However, with that said, we appreciate you guys checking this out, and we will be back very shortly with more commentary.